Here is this week's charity news for the 12th of July 2024. Swimming is on Monday at Medina Leisure Centre between 1.15pm and 2.15pm. We have the whole use of the large pool, so whether you are a lane swimmer or someone who just enjoys gentle exercise in the pool, this is open to everyone. The cost is £6 and transport can be arranged where possible. There is yoga on Tuesday at Millbrook House between 1.45pm and 2.45pm. Refreshments are served afterwards. The cost is £4. Our weekly coffee and chat is on Wednesday at Millbrook House between 10am and 11.30am. The cost is £2, which includes coffee and cake. Staff are always on hand to help with any inquiries and equipment will be available to try out. Thursday is Mix and Mingle. This group meets between 10.30am and 2pm every week. Booking for this group is essential and at the moment there is a waiting list for people to join. Our wonderful volunteers will be serving refreshments at the Cows and Gurnard Open Art this weekend. We are there today, Saturday and Sunday between 10am and 4pm. This is held at the Gurnard Village Hall and everyone is welcome. Please pop in for homemade cake and support the charity. Next Saturday, the 20th of July, we will be attending Newport Carnival. We will be meeting at 6.30pm in Town Lane, outside the parish centre. The parade leaves at 7pm and will parade through the town. A meeting was held and it was decided that everyone will wear our Sight for White t-shirt with dark trousers. If you would like to join us on the parade, please call the office so we can arrange a t-shirt for you. The fortnight tennis held in Ryde is on next Monday the 22nd. This is held at a Ryde Mead Tennis Club behind Yelf's Hotel starting at 9.30am to 10.30am. The club volunteers help with this club and are always on hand to offer help. Please remember you are all invited to our open day of celebration here at Millbrook House on the 29th of July between 12.30pm and 3.30pm. We are inviting members, volunteers and supporters of the charity to all come together to see firsthand the incredibly positive effect our services have on people. Our monthly 100 Club has spare balls available. If anyone would like to buy a ball, it is £2 a month or £24 for the full year. The more balls in the draw, the higher the prize money each month. If you would like to take part in our monthly draw, please call the office. This is part of our fundraising activities. We are appealing for Tombola prizes for our upcoming summer events. If you have anything you wish to donate, please do not hesitate to pop into Millbrook House or alternatively, please call the office to arrange collection. If you would like to join any activity or want more details, please call the office on 522205. Hampshire and Isle of Wight officers recognise at an awards night for saving lives from the Isle of Wight radio read by Lee. Several Hampshire and Isle of Wight constabulary officers have been recognised for their incredible work in saving lives. The officers were presented with commendations of the Royal Humane Society Awards by Chief Constable Scott Chilton and Vice Lord Lieutenant of Hampshire Colonel Charles Ackroyd following difficult incidents where our officers had to act quickly to save a life. On the 30th of April 2021, police were called to a report of a young man who had been stabbed in Slindon Street, Portsmouth, and was bleeding badly. P. 
PS, James Cole, got there first and immediately applied first aid and pushed his knee down on the wound. PC Sarah Hopes arrived shortly afterwards and quickly established a sterile area around the victim. When the ambulance arrived, both officers assisted them and PC Hopes later accompanied the man in the ambulance to hospital. The first reactions of the officers meant that the man survived. The officers were both awarded the RHS Certificate of Commendation for their actions. Police Sergeant Sean Brennan, Police Constable Vassos Gogos, Tom Hillier and Karen Stevenson, and PCSO James Heden were all awarded the RH, RHS Certificate of Commendation. On the 22nd of May 2022, these officers were called to a concern for welfare incident on the footbridge at Porchester Railway Station to help a man who was severely distressed and on the wrong side of the footbridge. PC Hillier, who was a PCSO at the time of the incident, said, We unfortunately go to high-risk incidents like this very often these days. I do not think society as a whole understands the nature of our work, and one minute we are at a traumatic incident like this, and the next we might be dealing with some low-level incident, and we're expected to be as if it never happened. At the end of our day, our number one priority is saving lives, and that is what we ended up doing on that day. In the early hours of the 26th of March 2023, police were alerted to a woman who was in the water at Stokes Bay. Police Constable Roy Kimber, assisted by a student officer, immediately entered the sea to try to help the woman and speak to her and requested backup from more officers and the Coast Guard as he could not pull her out of the water by himself. Police constables Simon Tate and Gurdit Singh then entered the water to assist and together they managed to save the woman. The woman later thanked the officers, specifically stating that she would not be alive had it not been for police staff controller D. Court, who kept the woman speaking to her on the phone throughout. PCs Kimber, Singh and Tate were awarded the RHS Certificate on Parchment. Police Staff Controller D. Court was awarded the RH Certificate of Commendation. On July the 9th, 2023, a man called police telling them he thought people were trying to break into his house in Gunwolf Keys, Portsmouth. But as PC Jamie O'Byrne and PS Andrew Way were taking the man's statement, he suddenly had a seizure and then he stopped breathing. The officers immediately started CPR and after a few minutes he started to breathe again and the officers placed him in the recovery position. The officers then had to restrain the male as he became aggressive before, before paramedics arrived and conveyed him to hospital for treatment. Both officers were awarded the RHS certificate of resuscitation. P.S. Way said, This incident shows exactly how policing can change in a matter of seconds. We initially thought we were attending a break-in, which quickly escalated into being face of a male who went into seizure, then cardiac arrest. We are thankful that we managed to res resuscitate the male, and he got the required medical assistance he needed, and neither of us sustained any injuries. Chief Constable Scott Chilton said, Our officers are often faced with extremely distressing and traumatic incidents, sometimes on a daily basis. To be able to put aside the emotions of what they are facing and then act quickly to help those in need and save lives of people at risk of danger shows incredible courage and professionalism. I commend every single one of our officers who have been dealt with similar incidents and I'm sure the public would join me in thanking them. Hello, this is an article from the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Sue. Islanders invited to become NHS public governors. Islanders are being invited to take a role as a public governor with a local NHS foundation trust. Two public vacancies have opened for the role within mental health, learning disability, children's and community services across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight Community Mental Health and Learning Disability Services transferred to Southern Health on the 1st of May 2024 in preparation for the creation of the new Hampshire and Isle of Wight Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust later this year. Governors become members of the Council of Governors 
and provide a vital link between the public and the trust. They help communicate the ideas, feedback and concerns of local people. Their role is to raise concerns and ask questions on behalf of people living in the constituencies they represent, to support our patients, their families and carers and help shape the way the Trust provides healthcare services. Lynn Hunt, Chair of Southern Health, explained, Our public governors play such a vital role. They not only help us to make strategic decisions about our services, but most importantly, they are the voice of the public and our patients. So if you have a passion for healthcare and want to make a sizeable difference, I encourage you to become a public governor. Being a governor is a rewarding role that enables you to be at the heart of the NHS in your community. Governors have played a strong role in trust developments in recent years, sitting on interview panels for the new board members, being involved in work that directly affects frontline services and attending public events to share the work of the trust. Adrian Thorne, Southern Health's lead governor, added, Governors play a key role in making sure our patients' and carers' voices are heard and they are a critical friend to the trust. To be most effective, we need individuals with all sorts of backgrounds, interests and skills to join the Council of Governors and fully represent our communities across Hampshire. Nominations for this role are open now and will close on Friday the 12th of July at 5pm. Hi, this is Steve reading a story from Isle of Wight Radio with the headline Island Education Improvement at the Heart of New Draft School Place Planning Strategy. The huge challenge facing Isle of Wight schools amid falling birth rates and the steep decline in pupil numbers is laid bare in the island's first mainstream school place planning strategy published today, that's Wednesday, by the Isle of Wight Council. The draft strategy sets out why the authority must tackle the high number of surplus places within schools to ensure they are adequately funded and, most crucially, Isle of Wight children and young people receive the world-class education that they deserve. The strategy also supports and indeed underpins the new draft education strategy, the Council's ambitious blueprint for school improvement launched earlier this week with the clear goal of turning around an underperforming school system to secure a brighter future for Isle of Wight youngsters. But it's not just the Council which believes immediate action is needed to pull the Isle of Wight out of the bottom 10% of local authorities for key performance indicators. It's the people who best understand education on the island, our dedicated school leaders. The voices of many head teachers and school governors have been raised as one in this issue, asking for a clear strategic vision for the whole island. As far back as 2022, They warned that keeping too many schools open risked condemning pupils to a mediocre education. The Isle of Wight head teacher executive wrote, For the school system on the island to thrive and children to receive the education they deserve, it is imperative that schools are full and that there is a good mix of larger and smaller primary schools in the right geographic locations which feed into appropriately sized secondary provision. The island then has a chance to create a self-sustaining system where financial viability and high-quality education can be delivered hand-in-hand. Islanders too ranked quality of education as their top priority during engagement meetings held across the island by the Council's newly installed Children's Services team to provide an understanding of the reasons as to why change is required. Since taking over from Hampshire in February, The team has visited every island school and worked closely with head teachers and governors to understand what's important to them. And why that change is needed. Nationally, birth rates have reduced to their lowest level since 1941. The drop is having a significant impact on the island where, by 2027, just 920 children are expected to start reception. A considerable drop from 1,404 in 2018. As of October 2023, there were 1,898 unfilled school places across the island. 
By September 27, this number is forecast to rise to 3,056. The financial impact is stark and severe. For every empty seat, skills lose more than £4,500, affecting resources, opportunities and the quality of education that children receive. The ongoing trend indicates that, by March 2027, 22 primary schools may face budget deficits, potentially amounting to a cumulative £7.4 million or more. Surplus places means schools struggle to maintain a broad and high-quality curriculum. Falling rules also make planning and staffing decisions difficult, with schools potentially having to make year-on-year redundancies or having to restructure. Naomi Carter, the Council's Service Director for Education, Inclusion and Access, said, Addressing these issues is not just about numbers. It's about ensuring every child on the Isle of Wight receives the best possible education. We are committed to making these necessary changes for the future of our children. Today's report sets out how school places will be managed to ensure parents and carers of all children living on the island can secure a good school place within a reasonable distance of home. It identifies the total number of empty school places in each area of the island and proposes a reduction, taking into account such factors as new housing developments, while maintaining some surplus to accommodate potential future growth and parental choice. At the same time, the strategy identifies the positive opportunity to expand the provision of high-quality education for our children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities, that's SEND, one of five key priorities within the draft education strategy. By 2030, the Council's vision is that all children on the island will be equipped with the skills and aspirations to access opportunities of their choice. Councillor Jonathan Bacon, the Cabinet Member for Children's Services, explained, With a steep decline in births, a clear school place planning strategy is required. This will see a reduction in the number of school places across the island to respond to the falling birth rate. But this will enable our remaining schools to be in the best possible position to improve outcomes for our children and young people by giving our school system and those within it the security that is desperately needed. It's true there's been a delay in bringing this forward, but this has been due to the need to get a fuller understanding of how education standards on the island can be improved and how place planning fits within the same. The draft strategy will be considered through Cabinet on Thursday 18th of July, and if approved, a detailed review will start during the summer to identify how the Council proposed to address the level of surplus places and identify what this means for the future of schools on the island. This gives officers, councillors and stakeholders an opportunity to listen and then act on feedback, which, in turn, will help take the draft strategy to the next stage in its adoption and implementation process. All islanders are being encouraged to get involved in this consultation by emailing strategic.planning at iow.gov.uk. This is Dan, reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. South East Local Authorities join forces to recruit more foster carers. Councils from across the South East have come together to create the country's largest local authority fostering partnership in a bid to increase the number of foster carers across the region. With more than 11,000 children in care across the South East and fewer than 3,000 local authority approved foster carers, there is an urgent need to recruit more people to provide safe, loving and local homes for vulnerable children. Launching today, Monday the 8th of July, Local Authority Fostering South East is a new virtual fostering hub bringing together the expertise of 20 councils from across the region, including the Isle of Wight. The new hub will ensure prospective foster carers have access to a centralised platform 
for their initial inquiries about fostering and will see local authorities work collaboratively to provide the best support right from the start of a carer's fostering journey. The new regional hub will be running marketing campaigns to raise awareness of this unique role and encourage more people to take the next step and become a foster carer with their local council. In doing so, they will benefit from comprehensive local training, generous financial assistance and ongoing support from a non-profit organisation. The hub will not replace the island's fostering service, which will continue to function as normal, but work alongside it to complement activity. Natasha Sampson, South East Regional Strategic Lead, said this is a really exciting time for fostering. For the first time in the South East, we are leveraging the collective skills, knowledge, resources and support of 20 local authorities to ensure children and young people have a stable home in a loving family, which they all deserve. The new hub will make this possible by increasing the number of local foster carers and making sure they are well supported through their recruitment journey and beyond. I would urge anyone interested in fostering to get in touch with us to find out more about becoming a foster carer with your local authority. The Isle of Wight Council is a proud partner of this National Department for Education, the DFE, funded project, with local authority fostering South East being the largest of nine regions taking part in this pilot programme. Prospective foster pet carers will also benefit from a new fostering ambassador scheme, enabling them to speak to an existing carer to find out what this life-changing role is really like. More information on becoming a foster carer can be found on the new regional website, uh, capital L-A, small fostering, capital S-E, dot org, dot UK and by following Local Authority Fostering South East on Facebook, Instagram and X, formerly Twitter. Those interested in fostering can also contact the regional hub directly to speak to a member of the recruitment team by calling 0300 131 2797. Tesco shoppers see major changes to click and collect from the Island Echo, read by Lee. It's all changed at Tesco Extra in Ride as the supermarket giant introduces a new way to click and collect groceries. Since the introduction of click and collect facility around 10 years ago, shoppers have driven to a canopy at the far end of the car park to collect their orders from a delivery van. Those opting for the collection service will soon have to drive into one of four bays at the front of the store nearest to the delivery yard. New signage has been erected to point drivers in the right direction, but covered up until the new system goes live. It's understood that shoppers will have to input a code, which will prompt backroom staff to then bring out the shopping from inside the store. The move has resulted in the loss of four parent and child bays. One of the other major changes to hit Isle of Wight shoppers is a reduction in the click and collect time slot window from two hours to one hour. Island Echo is told that some staff face a pay cut as job will no longer entail any element of driving. It's unknown when the new way of clicking and collecting will become operational. Hello, this is an article from the Isle of Wight radio read by Sue. Compton Bay find revealed to be most complete dinosaur discovery in the UK in a century. However, before I start, I'm going to apologise for the mispronunciation of several of these words because I've never heard of them before. A dinosaur bone found on the Isle of Wight has been revealed to be the most complete dinosaur discovered in this country in the last 100 years following extensive analysis. The specimen with a pub pubic hip bone the size of a dinner plate and which is around 125 million years old was found in the cliffs of Compton Bay in 2013 by fossil collector Nick Chase before he tragically died of cancer. 
Jeremy Lockwood, a retired GP and University of Portsmouth PhD student, helped with the dinosaur's excavation and has spent years analysing the 149 different bones that make up the skeleton. Jeremy determined that the skeleton represented a new genus and species, which he named Comptonatus chassia, in tribute to Nick. Jeremy said, Nick had a phenomenal nose for finding dinosaur bones. He really was a modern day Mary Anning. He collected fossils daily in all weathers and donated them to museums. I was hoping we'd spend our dotage collecting together as we were of similar age, but sadly this wasn't to be the case. Despite his many wonderful discoveries over the years, including the most complete Iguandon skull ever found in Britain, this is the first dinosaur to be named after him. When it was first discovered, the specimen was thought to be known a known dinosaur called Mantelosaurus, but Jeremy's study revealed a lot more dinosaur diversity. Indeed, this is the second new genus to be described by Jeremy. He continued, I've been able to show this dinosaur is different because of a certain unique features in its skull, teeth and other parts of its body. For example, its lower jaw has a straight bottom edge, whereas most Iguan donations have a jaw that curves downwards. It also has a very large pubic hip bone, which is much bigger than other similar dinosaurs. It's like a dinner plate. Jeremy doesn't know why the pubic hip bone, which is placed at the base of the abdomen, was so big. It was probably for muscle attachments, which might mean its mode of locomotion was a bit different, or it could have been to support the stomach contents more effectively or even have been involved in how the animal breathed. But all these theories are somewhat speculative. Jeremy named the dinosaur Comptonatus after Compton Bay, where it was found. And Tonatus is a Latin word meaning thunderous. This animal would have been around a ton, about as big as a large male American bison, he revealed. Evidence from fossil footprints found nearby shows it was likely to be a herding animal. So possibly large herds of these heavy dinosaurs may have been thundering around if spooked by predators on the floodplains over 120 million years ago. Dr Susanna Maidment, senior researcher and paleontologist at the Natural History Museum, and senior author of a paper completed while supervising Jeremy's PhD, commentated, Comptonatus is a fantastic dinosaur specimen, one of the most complete to be found in the UK in a century. Its recognition as a new species is due to incredible detailed work by NHM Scientific Associate, Dr Jeremy Lockwood, whose research continues to reveal that the diversity of dinosaurs in southern England in the early Cretaceous was much greater than previously realised. The specimen, which is younger than Bryston Nears, but older than Mantelesaurus, two Igudonation dinosaurs closely related to Comptonatus, demonstrate fast rates of evolution evolution in Iguan donation dinosaurs during this time period. It could help us understand how ecosystems recovered after a putative extinction event at the end of the Jurassic period. Despite only four new dinosaur species being described on the Isle of Wight in the whole of the 1900s, there have been eight new species named in the last five years. The dinosaur has been added to the collections at the Dinosaur Isle Museum in Sandown on the Isle of Wight. The paper is published today in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology. Dr Martin Munt, Dinosaur's Island creator, said, 
ongoing research on the museum collection continues to reveal exciting new discoveries. Most of Nick's most important finds have remained on the island, a lasting legacy. We can look forward to many new types of prehistoric creatures being discovered from the island's cliffs and collection. Mike Greenslade, General Manager for the National Trust on the Isle of Wight, concluded, This extraordinary discovery at Na National Trust Compton Bay highlights the rich natural heritage of the Isle of Wight. Finding the most complete dinosaur in the UK in a century not only showcases the island's paleontological significance, but also underscores the importance of preserving our landscape for future generations to explore and learn from. Nick Chase's remarkable find and Jeremy Lockwood's dedicated research are a testament to the incredible history waiting to be uncovered here. We are thrilled to be part of this ongoing journey of discovery and scientific advancement. Again, I apologise for any mispronunciation. Hi everyone, this is Steve reading a story from the Island Echo, headlined Detailed Plans for New Penny Feathers Proposal Revealed. Further details about the latest proposals for the Penny Feathers site and ride have been revealed including a plans for a German supermarket, a Costa Coffee drive through and an 81-bed hotel. A hybrid planning application is expected to be submitted in September, which will seek permission for an initial 108 homes, of which 35% would be affordable, major road improvements, and the building of several commercial units with the outline planning for the further phases of the scheme to be built over a 10-12 to 12 year period. In total, 830 homes are set to be built on the empty land off Braiding Road and Smallbrook Lane, as reported by Island Echo last week. It can be revealed that commercial space looks set to be occupied by either Aldi or Lidl, likely to be the latter given their 2016 plans, and a Costa Coffee drive through would be built. A national hotel chain is expected to snap up the 81-bedroom development adding to the commercial and leisure offering in the Westridge area. In terms of the roads, new drawings reveal significant changes to the infrastructure around Westridge Cross, which itself would become a T-junction with the removal of the traffic light controls. It is proposed that part of Great Preston Road would become a cul-de-sac, with traffic instead directed through two new roundabouts. The idea of a braiding boulevard has seemingly been scrapped, with one of the roundabouts moved further north from its junction with Cothy Way. Under the new plans, Westridge Garage would not relocate, and the two houses at Westridge Cross would be sold and occupied instead of being demolished. It's said the sale of these two properties is likely to be completed within the coming months. Beyond the immediate works, outline permission is being sought from Isle of Wight Council, which would include the erection of up to 727 homes, further commercial space next to Busy B, 70 properties for care or extra care living, pedestrian access to Smallbrook Station, additional highway infrastructure, including internal roads and a bridge over the railway, plus formal and informal open space, parks and further biodiversity provision. It has been confirmed by the local authority that they do not require a new school to be built, so instead payments towards education on the Isle of Wight would be made in line with planning policy instead. However, space will be set aside to deliver community facilities such as a community hall, dentist, health hub or sports facilities. Plans for an energy centre have been scrapped with developers deciding to focus on a mix of solar and thermal panels coupled with heat pumps. The previously proposed scheme included a community centre with a polyclinic as a flexible use building and an adjacent small multi-use games area for activities like five-a-side football or basketball. Penny Feathers is seeking the feedback of local residents between now and Friday 26th of July. Comments can be given at www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash glf626r 
With further information available on the official website, that's www.pennyfeathers.co.uk. For the past 17 years, there has been talk of developing a whole new area of ride on land off Braiding Road, with a formal planning application submitted in 2013 and refused before a second application was submitted in 2014. Outline planning permission was eventually granted in 2017, with reserved matters subsequently application lodged in 2022. But in April 2023, councillors went against the council officer's recommendation of approving the application. It was said at the time that the decision would be taken to the planning inspectorate as the outline consent had expired, meaning the developers could not submit another second stage application in the hopes of gaining consent. Now, more than 12 months on, it appears that costly move hasn't happened, and therefore new plans are being proposed, effectively starting the planning process again, which sets the Penny Feathers scheme back by 10 years. This is Den reading an article from the Island Echo. Nation and Angel Radio team up in bid for Isle of Wight DAB licence. Commercial radio station Nation has teamed up with Angel Radio Isle of Wight to apply for a small-scale DAB digital radio multiplex licence from Ofcom. If the application is successful, it will enable radio stations to broadcast to just the Isle of Wight on DAB digital radio for the first time. The Isle of Wight application is a venture between local FM broadcaster Nation, seen by many as the Wave 105 replacement, and Isle of Wight FM broadcaster Angel Radio Isle of Wight. It comes after Isle of Wight Radio and Vectis Radio announced their partnership in May of this year, as they too are applying for a DAB licence. Chris and Bev Webster, managers of Angel Radio Isle of Wight, have said, As the island's oldest Ofcom licensed community radio station, we have seen the good that radio can do to serve the community, especially underserved members of the older generation. We know that many of our listeners now have DAB radios and we want to be able to reach them and we look forward to a digital future for our station. Teaming with Nation makes good sense for us as they are a commercial operator that cares about community radio. Jason Bryant, Executive Chairman of Nation Broadcasting, adds... Nation has been involved in small-scale DAB right from the early days of the Ofcom trials, from running multiplexes to backing them with their own services and deploying world-leading technology through our DAB multiplex business factum radioscape. Nation has a proven track record in supporting broadcasters, both commercial and non-profit, in achieving access to DAB digital radio, and I am excited for the opportunity for Nation to lead on DAB digital radio development in the Isle of Wight. Prospective radio services should make contact about being included on the Angel Radio Isle of Wight and Nation Broadcasting bid at www.muxcast. Hampshire and the Isle of Wight leading the way with COVID spring booster jabs from the Island Echo read by Lee. Most people in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight have been protected from COVID-19 than anywhere else in the southeast region, thanks to the hard work and commitment of teams working on the vaccination programme. The 2024 spring programme has now drawn to a close and locally more than 180,000 eligible people came forward to take up their offer of the vaccine. NHS Hampshire and the Isle of Wight delivered the third highest number of vaccinations nationally compared to the other NHS integrated care boards. The uptake level in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight was 65.7%, which was the highest across the southeast and the fifth highest for population uptake across the country. Those eligible for the spring vaccination were people aged 75 years and over, 
residents of care homes for older adults, adults and children aged six months and over who have a weakened immune system. Dr. Matt Nesbitt, clinical lead for the COVID vaccination program at NHS Hampshire and Isle of Wight said, this phenomenal achievement could not have happened without a huge amount of hard work and collaboration between primary care networks, community pharmacies and the COVID-19 vaccination program team who glue all the bits of the system together. Our new Rovin vaccination vehicle was also launched this spring, which has helped us reach members of our local communities who may have not otherwise come forward. I would like to thank all the teams across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight who have taken part in the campaign, which has led to the high levels of vaccination across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. This will ultimately keep people and communities safe and healthy. Those eligible were able to get a vaccination from GP practices, pharmacies and pop-up and roving clinics. Hello, this is an article from the Island Echo, read by Sue. Powerless day boat towed into Medina by Cow's lifeboat. It was a case of so near yet so far for a River Medina-based day boat when it suffered engine trouble in the Solent on Wednesday. The boat, with two people on board, lost power just west of the Cowes Harbour entrance. Wind over tide conditions meant that anchor was unable to prevent the craft steadily drifting westwards, prompting the launch of Cowes RNLI lifeboat. Having launched at 1628, the lifeboat proceeded to tow the boat into the harbour and then onto the river beyond the floating bridge, where an alongside tow took it to its mooring on a pontoon off the aggregate wharf. The lifeboat returned to the station at 1730. Hello, this is Steve reading a story from the Island Echo, headlined Peer-to-Peer Swim, all set for 2024 return next Saturday. The Isle of Wight Marlins Swim Club annual peer-to-peer swim will return to the bay next Saturday, that's the 20th of July. Some 200 swimmers, of which around half are from the mainland, are set to take on the 1.8 mile challenge, which will begin adjacent to Sandown Pier at midday and end at Shanklin Sandown Rowing Club. The event has happened only once in the past four years due to COVID and weather cancellations in 2020, 2021 and 2023. A backup date of the 3rd of August has been secured for this year, in case bad weather hits on the 20th of July. Remarkably, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the race, with the Marlin Swim Club running it for the past two decades. The event could not take place without many volunteers and local organisations, including Sandown Shanklin Independent Lifeboat, Ride Insure Rescue, Shanklin Sandown Rowing Club, Ride Beach Lifeguards, Shanklin Deep Sea Fishing Club, volunteer kayakers and many others for providing their time and expertise. Hello, this is Francis. And this is Tony. Good morning. We now move on to news items and sport. First of all, a message from our new MPs. Richard Quigley, where do I start? Firstly, with a huge thank you to everyone that turned out to vote, regardless of how you voted. Secondly, thank you to all of you that voted Labour, some for the first time, but all of you because you wanted something different. Thank you to Bob Seeley for being the MP for the biggest constituency in the country for seven years. I wish him well in whatever he does next. The campaign was fun, hard work, but that's the point. The beauty pageant is done. The proper job starts now. So, what's it like in that there parliament, I hear you say? Well, I got here on Sunday afternoon to be thrown straight into the induction process. We each get a buddy to help us navigate Port Callis House and the Houses of Parliament. Everybody will have tales of still getting lost even after nine years of being there, which sounds ridiculous until you walk inside. It's vast. On my second day, I was convinced I knew where I was. Rookie mistake. 
I walked up and down the same staircase for 20 minutes, then decided to get in a lift, only for the lift to take me back to the same staircase. At least I wasn't the only one. The history and feeling of the building is quite something. Such a palace would never get built today and the sense of responsibility to honour that, that history and the purpose oozes out of every pore. That doesn't help with directions, mind, but it puts you in your place. We've all heard and got tired of the stories of sleaze and corruption over the last few years. And in 2018, a code of conduct and behaviour was introduced, the only parliament in the world to have one. A lot of work has been done on the culture and how people treat each other. You're right, it should have been done years ago. To the point I can honestly say, it is the friendliest workplace I have ever stepped foot in. The staff, three and a half thousand of them, are incredibly helpful and friendly and don't, e don't even smirk when you are clearly lost. Instead, they stop what they're doing and assist you on your way. It is one of the most efficient places I, I have started working. The induction, provision of equipment and early advice was incredibly slick. I've been given a laptop, iPad, personal alarm, three chargers, two pens, a pad and a rucksack to help get my office going and the whole process took 90 minutes. Until my office was set up, you can get me on richardquigley.mp at parliament.uk. But the main reason I'm here is to serve the Labour government to effect the change you said you need. Our first meeting with the boss was all 412 Labour MPs in Church House. There's no rooms big enough for us all in the House of Common, Houses of Parliament. Keir gave a heartfelt and passionate speech on what we do to make the difference. Joy, but no gloating, no showboating, straight down to business. We then had our introduction to the Whips Office. Again, no gloating, no showing off, but a very honest talk about the work we have to do the scale of the task and the need to work together. No going home early. Politics is now back in the business of service. The first bit of real business was electing the speaker, sitting on the green benches on the government side. A display of unity in the house. Rishi Sunak speaking eloquently and graciously, graciously about his defeat, wishing the new government well. Keir Starmer thanking Mr Sunak for his service and commitment. I don't think I've ever been this excited, yet undaunted by a new job. Thank you. And from Joe Robertson. It is the greatest honour and privilege to represent my home, Isle of Wight East, for Parliament. I want to thank all those involved in the election campaign, particularly those who devoted so much time to knocking on doors, delivering leaflets, speaking to residents and attending events. I want to thank my predecessor Bob Seeley for his seven years of energetic service and commitment to the island. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the campaign efforts of all the candidates who stood for election last week. I am sure that each of them will continue to make a positive contribution to the island in various different ways. Now that the election is over, it is my duty to represent all residents in the East White, regardless of who they voted for or whether they voted at all. During the election campaign, I said that I would work with any government, Conservative or Labour, now that Labour is in power in Westminster, I will work with Labour as promised. But the first time, for the first time, the island has two MPs, 
and from different parties, Richard Quigley in the West and me in the East. It is incumbent on Richard and me not only to work constructively with the government, to put, but to work with each other to achieve for the whole island. I know Richard as a fellow Isle of Wight councillor and I am confident that we can continue to have a good working relationship. We have already appeared on local radio together and managed to find each other in Westminster on Monday. This is a new experience for us both equally. In the first 48 hours as MP, I appeared on BBC television and radio to talk about my priorities, including dealing with ferry prices and timetables. I've also visited an open day for people with disabilities at Royal Victoria Yacht Club. It was great to have the opportunity to speak to volunteers who were supporting the activities and people with disabilities from different local groups on the island. We even managed to get out on the water before being drenched in a post-election rain shower. Having managed to get some rest after six, 40 hours of no sleep, I went up to Westminster on Monday to begin the induction process that all new MPs must go through. Much of it is quite dry and procedural, dealing with the various House of Commons departments. Other aspects of induction were the Conservative Parliamentary Party. I was told it would be like the first week at school or college, which is exactly how it felt. However, the grandeur of the Palace of Westminster brings home the huge responsibility placed on the shoulders of each and every MP. On Tuesday, we re-elected Sir Lindsay Hoyle as the Speaker of the House of Commons and began the process of all MPs swearing in. I was sworn in as the new MP for Isle of Wight East just after eight o'clock at night on Tuesday. I am now back home and meeting with residents, businesses, community groups and individuals, including Ride Town Board, the Chief Executive of the Isle of Wight Council, a Times journalist regarding planning and a local head teacher, in addition to attending a King's Award presentation for voluntary service to Sandown and Shanklin Independent Lifeboat. I will be setting up my office in the East White in the coming weeks, but in the meantime, residents can contact me on my parliamentary email address, which is joe, that's J-O-E, dot robertson dot mp at parliament dot uk. Further contact details to follow. Finally, I want to extend my warmest and heartfelt wishes as we begin a new and exciting chapter for the island. Football's coming home. After seven long years, a football club has returned home. Knighton Community Football Club are finally back at Springhead, their former home of 60 years, after planning issues had kept them away for so long. It is all thanks to the fantastic work of their committee and the local community, says the club. On Saturday, July the 7th, the club opened their gates again, hosting two football games, Newport under 15 ladies versus Rue Valley under 15 ladies and Knighton versus Knighton Reserves. Over the past seven years, the committee has been working hard to re-establish football back in the village, said a spokesperson for the club. The initial projects were hindered by lack of funds and then the COVID pandemic. Through a huge fundraising campaign comprising quizzes, raffles, bingo, race nights, charity football matches, sponsorship, Clothes sales, plant sales, Easter egg hunts, and even an annual card shouting event, and the sale of some land for the development of four houses, 
the club has been able to invest in some infrastructure. The club has purchased two porter cabins to serve as changing rooms and a separate referee room. With the assistance of local builders, plumbers, electricians, groundwork contractors and others with the necessary skills, the porter cabins have been turned into changing rooms with showers, toilets and a small washroom, said a spokesperson for the club. The changing rooms have been painted and look fantastic. Another local business has assisted massively with the pitch which looks in great shape, although the infamous Knighton Slope is still here. The local community have got right behind the club returning to Springhead by supporting the fundraising events and local businesses have been fantastic with prizes, sponsorship and general support throughout the past seven years. The committee have been relentless in their work to get football back to the village and would like to thank everyone for their help and continued support. In 2024, football in Knighton is truly coming home. If you'd like to get involved, contact Club Secretary Craig Ross by emailing craigross101010 at gmail.com. Stampeding cows almost killed me. A dog walker has spoken of the terrifying moment he was left fighting for his life after being trampled by a herd of cows. David Mackay, a semi-retired vet from Knighton, estimates he ha only had around 20 minutes left to live following the attack on June the 6th. He suffered a collapsed lung, bleeding in his chest, 12 ribs broken, and multiple fractures. He told the candy press, if it hadn't been for the air ambulance, I don't think I'd be here today. As he has done on many occasions, the 64-year-old was walking his four dogs along a coastal path and then a field behind the pepper pot and pan lane near Knighton. Conscious of the fact that there were cattle, David put his dogs on short leads and walked around the edge of the field. But calves took a shine to the dogs, and before David knew it, a cow charged at him, knocking him to the ground. At that point, I let the dogs go, he said. Then all the other cows led into the attack, and I was trying to keep my feet, but they just trampled me, circled me, and pushed me down. David battled to get to the edge of the field, and when he did, the cattle eventually lost interest. David could tell he was badly hurt and managed to call his wife and 999. Hampshire and the Isle of Wight Air Ambulance found him from the air and a team on foot rushed to his aid before flying him to Southampton General Hospital. Three of David's dogs, Olive, Patches and Willow, were found shortly after but it took another four hours to locate Ernie, who is blind. David said the village spirit came out and the man from the undercliff found him in a little burrow. The cows had given him a good quicking and he had bruising, but it's not serious. Discharged from hospital eight days later, David is now recovering at home. Even as a vet, he said he was surprised by the herd's aggression. With hindsight, you could say I shouldn't have walked through, but I'd done it many times before, and it was public. I didn't feel I was that irresponsible, really, he said. Air Ambulance Director of Income and Engagement, Keith Wilson, said, David was in a perilous position, critically ill. Without immediate specialist care, he may not have lived to share his story. Our service is a lifeline to people on the island. As a charity, it is only thanks to our dedicated supporters 
that we are able to be there for patients like David 365 days a year. TV's SAS star checks out the island. A star of hit TV show SAS Who Dares Wins visited the Isle of Wight last week. On Saturday, July the 6th, Jason Fox was at Freshwater Lifeboat Station for a ceremony to name a new vessel. Spirit of the West White Five, the Gillian Scott, is a new Atlantic 85 lo- li- lifeboat costing £180,000. Accompanied by wife Jules, the former UK Special Forces soldier and Royal Marine Commando gave a speech to those in attendance. Taking to Facebook afterwards, he said, Some place the Isle of Wight. Great weekend at Freshwater Independent Lifeboat naming their new Atlantic 85 and exploring what the island has to offer. The ceremony also saw performances from the Brass Monkeys and the Bay Whalers. While here, Jason and Jules also visited Ventnor Botanic Gardens. Jason is no stranger to the island, having visited on a number of occasions when he was a child. Last year, he brought his live tour, Life at the Limit, to Shankton Theatre. Smoother ride on cycle track. An essential section of the Newport to Sandown cycle track at Blackwater has been revamped to improve ride quality and curb flooding. The upgrade, undertaken by Island Roads on the Isle of Wight Council's behalf, means the stretch between Blackwater Hollow and Birchmore Lane has now reopened. The likelihood of further closures during heavy rainfall periods is expected to decrease. The most flood-prone 30-metre section was uplifted and resurfaced using freely draining material to minimise waterlog instances. Additional, additionally, another 540 metres of the track was also resurfaced. Work from Island Roads crews, aided by recent dry weather, resulted in the project finishing ahead of the original completion date of July the 12th. A spokesperson for Island Road said, As users of the route will know, during periods of heavy rainfall the track becomes difficult to use or indeed impassable because adjacent ponds overflowed across it. This work is designed to improve the ride quality along the whole section. Ologies Research Follow-up Participants of a 34-year-old study on allergies and asthma are being asked to come back for a follow-up. Researchers from the David Hyde Asthma and Allergy Research Centre at St Mary's Hospital are sending out calls to all who took part in the Isle of Wight Birth Cohort Research Study to continue with one of the oldest studies. They would have been born in 1989 or 1990. Professor Hassan Arshad of the University of Southampton and NIHR Southampton Biomedical Research Centre led the project. He said, The Isle of Wight birth cohort provides a unique wealth of information. Being able to study asthma and allergic diseases across three generations helps us to understand how genetics and environmental exposures influence health across generations. Seven prior studies have been undertaken. Participants are now asked to fill out a questionnaire and attend a health check. Participants who have not yet been reached can contact the research team at 07710 or email 
i o w n t dot study dot i o w at n h s dot net over 90 people attended the successful open day for people with disabilities hosted by the royal victoria yacht club this year the event which took place on july the 8th and has been celebrated since 1981 offered enjoyable boat trips barbecue lunch and afternoon tea guests were taken on trips spanning wooden creek on a range of motorized boats due to windy conditions preventing sailing on the solent unfortunately the disabled sailing association catamaran was restricted to the pontoon for the day due to the weather. Visitors were joined by Deputy Lieutenant Kate Collins, MP Joe Robertson and Parish Councillor Cheryl Fontana, who also ventured onto the waters of Wooden Creek. Beyond the boat crews, over 80 RVYC members volunteered, ensuring guests had a memorable day. Refreshments were served by the Isle of Wight Hospitality with cakes provided by club members and donations from local businesses, including Medina Foods and Grace's Bakery. Music amplified the lively atmosphere courtesy of local bands Island Jive and Rum with the Pineapple. The tombola raised over £800. Coupled reunited with lost koala, a family that travelled all the way from Derby to the Isle of Wight to collect a lost teddy has thanked the community for helping them. Malcolm and Margaret Harrison, both in their 80s, had been holidaying on the island when they lost stuffed koala Susie on a bus travelling from Newport to Ryde. As soon as the bus left, I realised I'd dropped her, said Margaret. I'd lost my little koala who was very special to us. We waited at the stop, but Susie wasn't handed in. Margaret said she was heartbroken at the thought of leaving the island without her sentimental keepsake and appealed for help in locating her. The county press posted a photo on Facebook and the mother and daughter who found Susie came forward offering to reunite her. It was a very happy occasion, said Margaret. This means we can return to the island with happy memories. Nick hitting form at right time for Olympics call-up. One of Europe's top discus throwers, the island's Nick Percy, has realised his lifelong ambition of being chosen to take part in the Olympic Games. Nick has this week been selected to represent Team GB at the Paris Olympics, which starts later this month. The 29-year-old Scott from Bonchurch, currently ranked 34th in the world and second in Great Britain, goes into the Olympic Games in the form of his life. Nick, who attended ride school, has thrown other distances of more than 65 metres, all in Oklahoma, even before he got the call rubber stamping his selection, but safe in the knowledge his throw reached Olympic qualification standard. Nick said he had no shame in admitting he would be a blubbering mess and that it would be pure joy when the call came in. It has been such a long journey. When I was younger, then a few years where I didn't get in all together, but throwing events take a long time to develop, Nick explained in an interview with Scottish Athletics. The sacrifices made over the years to fulfil this dream have been well worth it. Seaside hat making fun for the summer. A hat making extravaganza is coming to Sandown 
as the seaside town prepares for its regatta this summer. The regatta hat factory will open its doors on Sandown High Street from Wednesday, July 17th. Budding hat makers will be able to drop in for free creative inspiration over four weeks leaning up to the regatta in August. Sandown Carnival Chair Paul Coolslant said we will be delighted to bring back the tradition of hat wearing at Sandown Bay Regatta last year. Our hat making workshops supported by Art Council England were incredibly popular and often oversubscribed. It was clear the community wanted more so we're really stepping up what we can offer this town's residents and visitors this year. Island and mainland artists have come on board as part of the hat making fun with a brief to create spectacular headwear for the Grand Regatta Hat Parade on Sunday August the 11th. Sandown Carnival is working in partnership with Boo Jump and Snark to set up the hat factory. Project manager Tracy Mikic said last year we saw some amazing giant hats inspired by legendary hat wearer Gertrude Schilling, the mascot of Ascot. This year we're turning the spotlight on sundown. We've invited creative practitioners to capture the essence of Sandown's heritage, culture and unique nature and come up with a new collection of big eye-catching headwear. The results will be shown off at the summer carnival parades as well as the regatta and they'll feature in an exhibition of key arts later this year. The regatta hat factory at 105 High Street will be open Wednesdays to Sundays midday to 8 at night through to the weekend of August 10th and 11th. To apply to book a session, email hello at boojumandsnark.co.uk That's hello at boojumandsnark.co.uk TV team dig in festival site. A special TV television segment filmed on the island is set to feature on BBC's The One Show later this year. The county press got a sneak peek at what was filmed on our shores. An archaeological investigation at Afton Down, the Isle of Wight festival's former site. Among those involved in the project was Kelly Weatherick, 46, from Totland, a landscape archaeologist, trustee of Vectis Archaeological Trust and curator at Dimbola Museum and Galleries. Speaking to the county press at the site on Wednesday, she said, This year we, Dimbola, have an outreach exhibition for Experience 25 which is 25 years of Isle of Wight festivals, one of which took place here, Afton Down, in 1970. We were approached by the BBC to ask if we wanted to be involved in a short film on the archaeology of the site. I said absolutely, and put a rubble together representatives from the Trust. Vectis searches. Isle of Wight Natural History and Archaeology Society, trustees and employees of Dimbola, the Finance Liaison Officer of the Isle of Wight Heritage Service and general volunteers, a real mix of people. We are calling it an investigation. We're not doing a full-scale dig, but we're looking for surface finds and we do have metal detectorists going down to recover items. We have recovered some interesting things. Coins, buckles, bottles, lots of ring pulls, 
plectrums, buttons, a Pepsi bottle, and they all tell a story. We have the original plans for the site so we know what was happening and where. So far, the best find has been parts of the perimeter fencing, a real tangible link to that position in the landscape. It's surreal when you look at the iconic pictures of the festival and then finding evidence that backs it all up. We can orient ourselves and aspects of the festival site. BBC presenter Mark Allright said, I'm here with The One Show and we're doing a piece about archaeological effort. It's fascinating. I'm a massive music fan myself and trying to imagine what it was like at the festival in 1970 where there were no doff acts, only killer content. It was a festival of headliners and to stand in that field and listen to that music and watch those people play is something I can only dream of. I found a ring pull, picked up with my own hands and added it to the thousands of others we found. What I love more than anything else is people's stories, talking to the guys about what it was like to be there and contrasting that with festivals today that are so commercialised and corporate. That was genuinely a happening and that happening was on the Isle of Wight and this place is so beautiful. To imagine those people here is just wild, it blows your mind. I know the island well and I love it. The island is not like anywhere else on earth. It's very special, it's very peaceful, but there's little pockets of activity. I used to love skating at Ride, but sadly that's not a thing anymore. The segment is set to air later this year in August. The project was filmed for BBC's One Show by Ride-based People Media UK, a television and film production company set up in 2021, run by Tony Steiger and Barbara Jane Mackey. Tony directed the shoot. He said, The 1970 festival is undoubtedly an iconic part of the island's identity and took place at a time of change and hope. Islanders, by and large, welcomed over half a million young people who revelled in the landscape for almost a week, listening to the best line-up in pop history. Sadly, some more powerful people were not so keen on the permissiveness and large festivals were soon banned. As a production company, proud of its mission to bring these island stories to the nation, we wanted to look back and discover what might lie underneath those newly ploughed fields at Afton Down, and viewers will be amazed at what was found and when the film is broadcast later this year. Days gone by. The country press has been bringing Islanders the news since 1884. We've delved into our archives. 125 years years ago in July 1890. A grass mowing competition was cancelled due to lack of entries. The lack of interest was thought to have been caused by the fact that the competition was restricted to machine work. Hundred years ago in July 1924, heaven Flowers brought us nearer heaven was the com comment made by John Seeley MP as he opened the first Isle of Wight Rose Society show held since 1914. The Society's show vehicle proved to be very successful, largely by the efforts of the Rev Hugh Le Fleming, avid rose grower and vicar of Ride, and Mr. E. Matthews, Honorary Secretary. 75 years ago, in July 1949, representatives from almost every organisation on the island 
decided to set up a working party to look at the problems of juvenile delinquency. Police records indicated that there had been a 50% increase in the number of crimes committed by juveniles on the island between 1947 and 1948. 50 years ago, in July 1974, part of Coppins Bridge in Newport was cordoned off after a one foot wide hole appeared in the road. Workmen said the damage could have proved very dangerous if a bus or heavy lorry had run over it. The Island Sailing Club's 60 mile round the island races attracted a record fleet of 475 yachts. Edward Heath, at the helm of Morning Cloud, won the Gold Roman Cup for the fourth consecutive year. Rower Annie off to Paris with Team GB. An island rower will represent Team GB at the 2024 Paralympic Games in Paris this month. Anne Caddick has been selected to represent Great Britain alongside Sam Murray in the PR3 Mixed Double Skulls. Growing up on the island, where she developed her passion for water sports, Annie spent her free time surfing with her family and her summers lifeguarding our beaches. She started rowing while studying at the University of Birmingham. Rowing appealed to Annie as it was the first time she had participated in a sport where, as someone with a cerebral palsy, she felt she could keep up with her able-bodied teammates and be treated to an equal rather than someone with a disability. While rowing with the university team, Annie's coach suggested she apply for British Rowing's Para Development Programme. Annie's career highlights include meddling at the 2023 European Championships and achieving Paralympic qualification at the World Championships in the PR3 Mixed Double Skulls. She said each day it gets a bit closer and I get a little more excited and a little more nervous. Sam and I have built a great partnership and we are looking forward to being the first to represent GB in this boat class. The competition is fierce and the standard is very close so I think we will see some exciting racing. Promotion is Simon's focused. The incredible career of island goalkeeper Simon Moore rolls on as he looks forward to his 17th season as the professional at a new club, Sunderland. Island-born Simon, who attended New Church Primary Lake, Middle and Sandown High School, recently signed for the Black Cats on a two-year deal. Simon, one of the most personable players in the game, may have amassed plenty of top-level experience, but he still feels the excitement of a teenager for the challenges that lay ahead with a championship club. Although Simon will be understudy to Anthony Patterson, he is embracing his new role supporting the young keeper. Simon, with 206 appearances, having played for Brentford, St Sheffield United, Coventry City, Bristol City, and Cardiff City also has his FIFA goalkeeper coaching badges, so plans to not only serve Sunderland and any potential future clubs, but to stay in the game in the long term. His younger brother Stuart is also a professional goalkeeper, currently with League Two outfit Morecambe. Their father and grandfather were also goalkeepers, Simon said of his new move, I'm proud to be part of such a huge football club like Sunderland and excited about embracing the challenge. My role is to support Anthony and to pass on my experience to the young squad. But I have the hunger and desire to work hard for any opportunities that come along. 
This will be Simon's 17th season in professional football. A lot of water has passed under the bridge since he started at Braiding Town. With Sheffield United, the 34-year-old was a hero, winning the League One title and making the division's team of the year. Season, I beg your pardon. Before gaining promotion from the Championship and playing in the Premier League, the pinnacle of his career. He then spent three seasons at Coventry, helping them to reach the playoffs final at Wembley as substitute keeper two seasons ago. I spent three brilliant seasons at Coventry's. After I signed from Sheffield United to the back of five successive and happy years there, said Simon. But once the season ended and the dust settled, Simon received a call out of the blue which has taken his career on a new path to the northeast. I thought it was time to move on and get a fresh challenge, Simon adds. The move to Sunderland happened very quickly. You just don't know where the sport is going to take you. Sunderland is a huge club, massively well supported. A club of this magnitude deserves to be at the top. I'm still young at heart, with a lot to give to the game. I've learned so much over the years. I reckon I've got another five or six good years left in me. For now, I'm at Sunderland. I will be working hard and continuing to learn and see where it will take me. What's on? Epic adventure, race against time. Around the world in 80 days, is set to hit the stage at the Apollo Theatre in Newport. The play is a celebrated modern adaptation by Laura Eason of Jules Verne's classic adventure story. Although first published in 1872, the tale has lost none of its excitement. The show is on from today, Friday, July the 12th to July the 20th, but not on the Sunday or Monday. A photographer, sorry, a photography exhibition by Pamela Parker will coincide with the play at the theatre. Never a dull moment, the jam-packed Fringe 2024. Popular event, Vent the Fringe, is back for 2024 this month for its 15th year. As a very wide range of fascinating presentations there, and all the local libraries have uh, articles which will tell you the details. Letters. Schemes abandoned. As a supplement to the excellent account by Alan Stroud on the inaccessibility of Ventnor and the problems of onward transport, the local business community, although delighted with the arrival of the Isle of Wight Railway in 1927, <laughs> There were several attempts to provide a cliff railway or funicular linking the station with the town centre and the Esplanade. In 1899, it was proposed to provide a steam-powered funicular railway between the station and the Esplanade Hotel. In 1891, a new scheme proposed a lift from the Esplanade to the station with an extension to the summit of St Boniface Down. In 1897, a scheme for an inclined light railway was proposed. In 1908, Fritz Baer, an engineer who had successfully promoted funicular railways elsewhere and who lived in Ventnor, promoted a two-railway electrically powered scheme, the first funicular li linking the Esplanade the town centre and the station, and the second linking the station and the top of St Boniface down. Finally, in 1924, Southern Railway, which had taken over the Isle of Wight Railway, proposed again a funicular linking the station with the Esplanade. The scheme was abandoned in 1927. All the schemes had the enthusiastic support of Ventnor Town Council businesses and local residents. They foundered because of cost, 
difficulty with the geological structures and constant opposition from the landowners of St Boniface Down. Dr Ian Saxon says, I told you so. Exactly a year ago I wrote about boundary changes to our island, published as Decision Borders on the Disastrous, County Press, 070723. I pointed out that we could end up with MPs from two political parties at the general election. I pointed out that in any vote relevant to the island, one MP could vote for and one MP could vote against, cancelling each other out and making our island's voice null and void. I pointed out that if we had a third MP for Isle of Wight Central, they could not cancel our voice out, as long as the third MP didn't abstain. I pointed out then, and I say again now, although we are technically considered part of the mainland, we are an island. We think as one community. Now, I don't like to say, I told you so, but I told you so. We are the jewel of the South. Now we have a Labour side of the island and a Conservative side of the island. Looking at the electoral maps, we are red on the west and blue on the east. Does that make us the Isle of Red, White and Blue? My hope and wish is that our lovely little Isle of Wight will never become divided by political policies. From Ashley Whitaker, Strategic Director of Children's Services. Over recent months it has been my privilege to listen to the views and opinions of a wide range of people, both children and adults, who care deeply about the Isle of Wight. When they talk about education, some share their recent and current experiences of nursery, school or college and their plans and aspirations for the future. Others reflect on what worked and could have been better when they were younger. What unites everyone is the consensus that the quality of education on the island can and must improve and an ambition to transform education outcomes to a standard that reflects the true potential of, island, of the island's children. Alongside this ambition is an acknowledgement that the world is changing and that education provision must adapt to reflect this. The pre prevalence of special educational needs and disabilities has increased, as have needs relating to emotional well-being and mental health. Skills required within the workforce of the future, locally and internationally, are constantly evolving. In many places, including the island, there is a significant reduction in the number of babies being born and a subsequent decline in the number of children entering primary school. These changes in the needs and numbers of children and requirements of employers demand an adjustment to the island school system. To realise the ambition contained within the island's new draft education strategy, complex and difficult decisions are needed. They are decisions essential to establish the foundations required to deliver a high-performing and world-class education system and to drive up academic and wider life outcomes for all children. By making these decisions, we will be able to deliver on our shared commitment to unlock the potential of children and young people and allow them to truly thrive. The letter from George Adams of Brading is headed Two Town Island. We now have a two town island. Both elected MPs have stated that they will fight for the good of islanders on the many and varied issues we face. Let us hope they can put aside their political differences and together do what's right for all of us. The present incumbent lost his seat because the electorate believed he was ineffective. You gentlemen wanted the bicycle. 
Now you have to pedal, and it's uphill. Paul's help to win World War II from Harry Pritchard of Portfield. Dear editor, alongside your front page story about how shamefully the management of Thornes Bay Holiday Park treated Polish citizens, you mentioned how the crew of the Polish battleship ORP Biskawika helped to defend cows from German bombers in 1942. However, the Polish people did far more than that to help Britain achieve victory in World War II. Over 8,000 Polish aircrew came to Britain in 1940, and when Fighter Command realised how skilful they were, two squadrons were formed, consisting almost entirely of Polish pilots. These brave pilots took part in the Battle of Britain, and in just 42 days, 303 Squadron shot down 126 German planes, more than any other squadron taking part in the battle. The Polish were years ahead of the British when it came to code breaking and had made replicas of the German Enigma machine, two of which were given to Britain, along with a description of how they worked and mathematical approaches to decoding German messages. Thanks to the Poles, the team at Bleshley Park were given a head start in their work to break the German Enigma codes. Without the help of Polish people, the war may well have had a different outcome. Penelope Baker writes, I urge bus users from Ventnor to attend the Isle of Wight Bus Users Forum at Methodist Church, Key Street, Newport at 11am on July the 27th to voice concerns over roads that access Upper Ventnor on the Roxall side. This is a public meeting open to all. The island planning strategy is out for public consultation till August the 19th and the Bus Users Group has a statutory right to be considered. The group must respond to provide a guide to solution-based action, avoiding unnecessary future hardship. Well, it's goodbye from Francis. And goodbye from Tony. The BBC In Touch programme follows and the scaffolding news follows. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello. It was only a few months ago that we told you that the charity Guide Dogs faced a £20 million funding gap by 2026 unless cuts to staff and services were made. We also know that many local voluntary organisations have had to reduce their services as donations are falling and volunteers aren't returning after Covid. And now we're hearing that the Royal National Institute of Blind People, which describes itself as the leading charity offering information, support and advice to the UK's visually impaired population, is itself facing serious financial problems. We understand that staff have been told that the organisation has to make cuts of millions of pounds. The estimates we've heard have varied between just over six and ten million and that redundancies are inevitable. So what is going on in the blind sector and what are the implications for visually impaired people as a whole in terms of services and support? I'm joined by the RNIB CEO, Matt Stringer. Matt, first of all, before we talk more about the implications of all this, tell us what's going on. What is the size of the funding gap and what are its implications? First of all, just to say, you know, the RNIB, we believe we're generating some great impact actually out in society at the moment. And this program we've announced to the organisation is about uh, moving the organisation on to really be able to optimise and deliver for blind and partially sighted people in the UK. We've seen, you know, recent strong performance on things like our ticket office closure campaign. And you know, we're very pleased with the campaign we've run around accessible voting, for example, during the general election and we've acted as a convener to bring together sort of charities and the royal colleges and the nhs across the devolved nations 
to work really well together on the eye health pathway. So, but that's you know, campaigning, strong... chief executive. That's campaigning. We're talking about finance, and you can't do any of those things to the same standard if you're in financial trouble. No, agreed. So, I mean, what we're trying to do is move the organisation on to be one that really tries to push those things I've mentioned and, and really make a difference out in UK society for all blind and partially sighted people. But to the core of your question on the finances, you know, we're an organisation that turns over just under about 100 million. That, that's the size of the RNIB. And yes, you're right. We're looking to take about 10% of the costs out. About 55% of our costs are, are related to people and about 45% of our costs related to sort of non-people. So we'll be looking to make a, a saving of about 10 million on, on that size. And that I mean, figure before... that you just given me of your income, you said just under 100, it was over 100 four or five years ago. It's been falling steadily, hasn't it, your income? Only because we've changed the organisation in, in moving out of regulated services, actually. So, you know, we had an amount of money that came in for the, the regulated services we offered, and we basically spent as much money as came in on those regulated services. So when we sorry, that, that's um, a bit jargony. Can you define regulated services for that? Yeah, yeah. So um, out of the statutory inquiry, part of what we did there was to move out of running care homes and schools and a college. And you know, we sold out of all those about three or four years ago. So those are the things we stopped doing coming out of the statutory inquiry. And, and as I say, we had money coming in for those and we had money going out being spent on those. So stopping doing those meant that clearly we didn't have the income coming in, but equally we didn't have the costs of running those services. So that's why you've seen a fall off from the RNIB of being over 100 million three or four years ago to being about 93 million at the moment. But I mean, I can understand why there'd be an initial impact of that, but this has been falling steadily. And that sounds as if it may not stop unless you can convince me otherwise. Um, well, you know, generating income is tough, you know, full stop at the moment. I think we're not immune as a charity from seeing challenges with generating income. The economy externally is tough. You know, we're not the only organisation who's finding it difficult to generate income. Our income projections this year are actually flat and, you know, a quarter into the year we're on plan. So, you know, we're not actually hemorrhaging income. Uh, we're about level on the year and we've got plans to try and grow that actually over, over the next few years. But it's not easy. And I think, you know, people will look outside and find that we're working in very difficult times economically, socially, geopolitically. You know, we're not immune from those pressures right. as the R and IB. And we need to sort of frame our response and set ourselves up to be here for many years to come. As you said at the top of the item, supporting blind and partially sighted people across the UK, you know, with a full panoply of, of services that you know they currently enjoy from the RNIB. Right. Well, I'll come back to the issue of how you generate more income. But can we talk about the implications? First of all, to your staff, if redundancies are inevitable, and I think you accept that they are, how are you going to decide where to make them? And, you know, what's the time scale? Well, we've communicated to the organisation last week and what we've said is, you know, we're going to spend six months working with the organisation on coming up with how the organisation is going to look going forward. So this absolutely isn't a crisis response or any sort of slash and burn. We're absolutely not in that camp. So just to finish off maybe the conversation about finances, you know, selling the services I've mentioned and moving our, our London office from Judd Street, you know, allowed us to build up a, a strong strategic reserve of about 30 million we spent six million of that last year. We're planning to run a deficit of six million this year. So, you know, we still have a lot of financial headroom. We're not doing this as a crisis. Right. But equally, it would be prudent for us to do it now and have a look at it to make sure we're setting ourselves up for the future and not finding we're facing into this problem in a couple of years' time. So, we're going to spend the next about six months working with the organization and what the future state of the organization is going to look like with a view to sort of implementing changes early in the new year of 2025. So how many redundancies do you think you might have to make? Well, we don't know that yet. I'm not trying to duck the question. We've been very open with the organisation about a 10% sort of reduction. I've talked about the deficit number this year to you, which again is, is well known around the organisation. We'll be working with the teams on that and coming up with plans as we get sort of through the autumn this year. Right. But that's still quite a lot of people. I mean, 10%, I think your employment level is about 1,300. Is that right? Somewhere in that region. That's a lot of people possibly losing their jobs. And as you and we are often reminding people, only around one in four blind people of working age have a job. And part of your mission is to protect the employment position of visually impaired people. How are you going to square that circle if you have to make people who'll have the most difficulty getting new work redundant? 
Well, first of all, we're not there yet with our teams and we're working on this with the teams consulting, as I say. It's too premature for me to give you precise numbers now or areas because we're not there yet. I am proud, actually, of the, of the work we've done as the RNIB in improving employment opportunities for blind and partially sighted people out in the UK. You know, we've run an internship programme with Thomas Poppington Trust that's got 50 visually impaired staff into work through that internship programme. And we've been signing up employers across the UK into our visibly better employer standards. And last year, we got about 700 visually impaired people into work. So, you know, our track record on employment recently has been quite good. There's more to do. We think there's, you know, over 10,000 visually impaired people in the UK who want to work, who are looking for work and aren't in work. And part of the RNIB is going out and making that case externally so we can get more people into work. But and Matt, so I, I have we'll to, see that carry on, I, I have to tell you that there's a persistent feeling among the many visually impaired people that we hear from and talk to that when this kind of things happen... It's visually impaired staff who tend to be first out of the door and that the jobs never seem to go from the top of the organisation. They go further down. What do you say to that? Well, that won't be the case in this. I mean, we're looking at the whole organisation from the top down. No, no one is exempt, including senior people. I've made that very clear and we'll be carrying on making that very clear in our communication to the organisation and you know, clearly communicating thoroughly and often to the organisation is something we'll be doing a lot of as we go through the next few weeks and months. I think, you know, the recent history of, of employing visually impaired people in the RNIB has been quite a good story. Uh, when I joined, we had about 12% of the staff were visually impaired. It's now just nudging 17% in a slightly bigger organisation. So we have actually provided employment to more visually impaired people in the RNIB over the last few years. So why do you think that perception exists? Because I'm not making it up. This is what people say to me. Um, I don't know, Peter, but what I do know is, you know, the numbers that I've just said are right. And, you know, we can point to quite a proud track record of employing more visually impaired people in the RNIB at the moment than we were employing five years ago. OK, let's try and explore the issue that you raised about generating income and how you get out of this situation. Many people will be surprised that this is happening now when only five years ago the RNIB underwent a major restructuring after something you mentioned. You know, it was told it could no longer run residential care because of serious failures in safeguarding. Wasn't that also the moment to make decisions securing long-term funding? What's gone wrong with the planning? Well, I don't think anything's gone wrong with the planning. I think what all organisations have been facing into in the last two or three years has been COVID and the cost of living crisis. The landscape is very different now than it was five years ago. Well, no, one, no one could have predicted those two things coming, which, which are clearly linked. We've been doing a lot of work on our fundraising strategy, as I say, and whilst as I said earlier, income levels plan to be pretty level this year, which is sort of prudent. We are doing a lot to try and drive our fundraising activities through, you know, work we're doing with corporate partners, with funds, with donors, where there's uh, some, some opportunity there. And we've been trying to drive our enterprises part of the organisation, which is really where all our commercial activity takes place. Again, to see that as a, as a source of greater income. So we have been doing quite a bit of self-help you know, to generate more income and not just carry on doing the same old things as the RNIB used to do. And I think, you know, having a plan this year to be level on the year is both prudent, but also in the in the broader context of fundraising being difficult, quite a good performance. Yeah, I mean, are you down on donations? A lot of organisations for visually impaired people and other charities are telling us that they are. I must say our income is, is going to be level on a year. We get income from three major sources, from, from legacies. We get income from in-year sort of individual giving activity and people doing fundraising activity. We get income from sort of funds, donors, philanthropy, corporate partners. And that's pretty normal for organisations to have maybe those three sources of income. As I say, we also have our enterprises arm, which is where we do commercial activity. I think what is challenging is the individual giving part of fundraising, where I think, you know, people up and down the UK are struggling from you know cost of living pressures as, as everyone is and finding it difficult maybe to be as generous with their charitable donations as they might have been before COVID and the cost of living crisis hit. You mentioned a third source of income which is you know some of your uh, what you might call more commercial activities. Your income as we've said has been consistently falling year on year and just to give two examples in that commercial area in 2019 income from government contracts was almost 14 million pounds in 2023 just a little over 
£2 million. And government grants in 2019 stood at almost £2 million. 2023, just over 360000 That's in the Charity Commission assessment of your work. What's the reason for that? Well, as I say, our focus is on what the future brings in terms of fundraising. We can see opportunity to drive our commercial activities where we, we run a retail site, we do consulting, we have a transcription plant uh, up at Gateshead and all those three parts of what we do commercially give us opportunity to drive growth, which we will be doing. And as I said, you know, we're pushing hard on the sort of funds for philanthropy donors side of things. So, you know, sort of playing what's in front of us in terms of where the opportunity is, maybe not looking back over time where there were historic sources of income, you know, which might not be like for like and available now. So, you know, as I say, we're, we're very much facing into the future. Well, uh, is, the that, is that another way of saying that you're not going to tell me whether any mistakes were made? I'm just wondering why in that area your income fell so much, not so much the grants, but certainly in terms of contracts. I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of all, all the contracts you might have raised that piece. I mean, I think, you know, we came out of running certain services. As I say, we came out of some of the regulated services, which would have meant that, you know, sources of funding weren't, weren't open to us anymore because we just simply weren't running those those services. So I think, you know, there are reasons why those numbers are what, what you said in terms of the fall off. I think the, the focus for the organisation in terms of where the opportunity lies has always been those three things I've mentioned, which is a sort of legacy income you know, working on the individual giving, you know, this sort of year in, year out fundraising for individuals and then really trying to drive those partnerships with funds, donors, corporate partners, where the organisation, I think, has a lot of headroom. And I think those three give us opportunity. I say that the very conscious decision we've taken to try and improve our income over the last year has been to see our enterprises division, as I say, all those commercial um, activities that we do as being a bit of a sleeping giant and we put in a lot of focus on trying to drive income there so there's a lot of self-help going on because you know as i said a few times it is tough economically and organizations can't stand still and rely on you know sort of money to come in and previous sources of income we've got to work incredibly hard you know to help ourselves and as i say we're also prudent to know that doesn't all fall in our lap straight away and that's why this year's income levels have been pegged to be sort of level with with the previous year right as far as most of our listeners are concerned the thing that they'll be most concerned about are services will you be cutting any of your services Look, we're, we're a great organisation that provides brilliant services for blind and party sighted people up and down the UK. Our reading services, our helpline, our sight loss advice services, all we do on education, employment, welfare, technology. I would absolutely expect that we would still be running the vast majority of those services at the end of this transformation programme. It's where we get our insight, it's where we get our connections with blind and party sighted people, it's where we get our validity. I think what we're looking at is how we can deliver those services. And just to maybe to give you one example of, of something that's shifted already, you know, we had a, a talk and support service where we connect blind and partially sighted people who may live alone, might be quite lonely, and get an enormous benefit from talking to peers. And that used to be a very clunky system where we would have a lot of people dialing out and making physical connections. We now we now use technology to allow people to connect themselves, and that has seen more people use the talk and support service using technology at a, at a cheaper cost, yes, with, with fewer staff inside the organisation. That's a change that was made two or three years ago, honestly, but it just sort of shows the, the example about how we might look at services and discharge them a bit differently in the future. But coming as this does so soon after news of, of cuts being made uh, by guide dogs and with services provided to visually impaired people by, by local authorities, for example, such as rehab for newly blind people coming under severe pressure... What can you say to our listeners to reassure them about their quality of, of life? Because there do seem to be a lot of people having to make cuts in the services, yourself included, because I can't see how you can make all these cuts without cutting some services. Well, look, we're enormously empathetic to, to blind and partially sighted people up and down the country. I mean, that's why we're here. It's our raison d'etre. So, you know, we're not doing this to look to somehow diminish and undermine the support that many people, you know, rely on day in and day out. And that's going to be the heart of our consideration as we as we go forwards. I think what you're seeing from, from guide dogs and, and you can't open, you know, the third sector every day without seeing other charities and other sectors all facing into, you know, what is a tough external environment? And it would be wrong of us just to sort of bury our head in the sand and think this problem will, will go away because, because it won't. So what 
you know, the encouragement I'd, I'd give to the listeners is that the, the RNIB is being sort of prudent and, and forward thinking in looking at this now and, and organising itself for the future so it can continue to be the great RNIB that hundreds of thousands of people rely on year in, year out in the UK. Can I just finally come back to the people who may be facing losing their jobs because they're the people who are going to be sitting worrying about this. Can you give a time scale on that and what the size of those job losses might be? Well, the time scale to the programme is what I said, I think, earlier, which is we're going to spend the next six months till the end of this calendar year to really work out what that sort of shape of the RNIB is going to look like going forwards and then with a view to sort of implementing early in the new year of of 2025. So, you know, that's the programme. And within that, we will, you know, work out where the areas of cost saving look like and, you know, at the appropriate time we can talk to staff about any redundancies, but that's, you know, as I said, we haven't done that yet. It will be premature to talk to you about it because we just don't have the detail and we will get to that as we work through that six month timetable I've just said. Is this one-off surgery, Matt, or a permanent move perhaps to what will have to be a downsized RNIB? Well, I think what we're trying to come out of this is an RNIB that's punching even more above its weight. You know, what I'm hoping is the RNIB of the future is an organisation that is much more impacted than, than now having set itself up to do that. I mean, this is a programme of work which I think will, you know, make the RNIB fit for the future for a period of time. But I think it would be foolish for any organisation to say that there's never going to be any future change. I mean, the world is changing so quickly. It would be foolhardy just to say that we're going to stand still. So this is a programme which, when we get through it, will then have a period, I think, of, of real stability in the RNIB. Matt Stringer, thank you very much indeed. And obviously, we'd like to hear your views, your comments, your questions about that interview. Next week, we're going to be doing a farewell interview with Cathy Yelf, the CEO of the Macula Society. If you've got a, a question or a comment you'd like us to put to her before she goes, you can email in touch at bbc.co.uk, leave your voice messages on 0161 836 1338 or you can go to our website for more information bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch from me peter white and producer beth hemmings goodbye bbc sounds music radio podcasts scaffolding and skips news week commencing the 12th of july 2024 newport area August Chip Shop, 2 to 3 St Thomas's Square. French Franks, 13 St Thomas's Square. 67A High Street, 130 to 132 Stainless Games, High Street, 8 Chapel Street. Andrew, Andrew Ross, 28 Holyrood Street. On the pavement outside JD Sports, 110 to 112 High Street, Guildhall, right hand side High Street, Vectis Housing Association, 30 Chapel Street, 71 to 74 Crocker Street. Ride area, pavement outside 29 to 30 Cross Street, ice cream parlour, Esplanade, Harriet House. 44 George Street, Vine House, 16 Castle Street, outside Artisan, Union Street, 37 Union Street, 60 High Street, 4A and 4B, Pier Street, Seaview, St Leonard's, 1 Pier Road, Seaview, 17 Cross Street, Card Factory, 32 High Street. Ride Area Skips, The Lodge, Ferry Road, Seaview, Schoolhouse Barn, Seaview High Street, Seaview. Ventnor Area, 2 East Street, Co-op, Pier Street, Mary Later's Alma, Esplanade, Post House, Steep Hill Road, 15 North Street, 1 Sydenham House, Hanborough Road, Hanborough House, Hanborough Road, Hurst, High Street, Ventnor Area Skips, Ventnor Fire Street, 19 South. Sandown Area, 
10 St John's Road. Shanklin area. The Crab Inn, 94 High Street, 112 Regent Street. Cows area, 1 Beckford Road.